So Seamus, you're back. I and better than ever, I hope. I am better than ever. Thank you, Paul. Um, it is really funny, you know. I, I as everybody who's listening probably knows, I was in the hospital last week for a full week, and there was a lot going on. Like I was supposedly in there for high blood pressure, and I was on the cardiac wing of the hospital, right? Like the fifth floor is for people with bad tickers. <laughs> but but your like, problem was that it was working almost too well. <laughs> right. Well, it was that my high blood pressure was caused by something else, which was caused by something else, which was caused by something else. And so they were working down this chain of, of causality here. And they're working on it. And, you know, as they fix something or as they experiment with something, it gets better. So even though I was on the cardiac floor, nobody was concerned about my heart. Everybody's like, your, your heart's pretty good. Your heart's solid. Um, that's not what's about to kill you. <laughs> um, but, uh, and I didn't realize how much better I was until I got out of the hospital. So check this out. This is no exaggeration. While I was in there, I lost 10 pounds. Wow. I, yeah. I look thinner. I am th like my pants that I just put on the exact same clothes the next week when you know I got out of the hospital I put on the exact same clothes I was wearing when I went in those were the clothes I had there at the hospital and the pants were falling down and the shirt which had been a little slug snug was now loose um wow another problem I've had that I haven't really thought about is I've been sensitive to light I mean I always joke about how I hang out in a dark room but it really was like I couldn't go out in direct sunlight without sunglasses. It hurt too bad. Like, even if it was a sunny day, I couldn't look directly outside without sunglasses. And this had crept up on me so slowly that I didn't think about it. And then we were riding home um, from the hospital, and I wasn't wearing sunglasses. And it didn't bother me at all. It wasn't like I was in no pain at all. So evidently, there was some extreme sensitivity to light. That was a you know a side effect of all the things that was going on, and that's fixed. So I can wow. you know just like it it felt so freeing. I didn't think about it before, but now I was like, oh, this is amazing. I don't you know have to shield. It doesn't hurt to look at sunny images anymore. <laughs> <laughs> and especially in spring, everything's you know sunny and, and blossoming and stuff. And it'd be really nice to be able to look outside once in a while. Right. Oh, that's another thing is I, I left for a week right at the, the big part of spring when spring really does its thing. So when I went in, it was still cold. Everybody was still wearing a jacket. And when I got home, all the trees had blossomed and filled in. And you know, this is my first spring at this house. So it was like, it felt like I'd come home and it was a different era or something you know all of a sudden these these trees are blocking light now right you know like every, how different thing i don't know how yeah we pretty, get spring yeah. here now uh right. we, we were in california we didn't but now we're in in uh, northern idaho and yeah it's only a matter of a few days and the, the trees are just like boom suddenly foliage everywhere right and so the neighborhood's like a different color the, the na direct neighbor has a pink tree. I mean, it's not going to be pink all year, but <gasps> during this point of... Oh, fine. Yeah. Yeah, but this part of spring, it's this giant pink tree. And so I feel like I've come home to the Shire, and it's this weird, super green, ultra-saturated ultra paradise. And there's shade and sunshine. You know, it was like all gray and rainy for weeks before I went in. And now it's super sunny. So everything feels like it's been turned up to 11. I smell more things. Again, who knows what how that got fixed, but I am definitely smelling more smells. Maybe that's just, you know, spring kicking in. Or maybe there was something <laughs> neurological going on. Like, uh, now everything feels different. Wow. Are you sure you're not the Fisher King? I, oh, wait, I've seen that movie, and I can't remember it now. <laughs> it was the old, it's an old legend about the, the, um, when the king is sick, the land is sick, and when the king is healed, the land is healed. Anyway. Hmm. Well, so that was amazing. That was, I feel so much better. I'm, I'm sleeping, you know, in proper blocks and not two or three hours at a time. 
just everything's better. Food tastes oh, no. better. Was that, was that happening before too? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Before, uh, my sleep was all fragmented into little two and three hour nuggets. And I couldn't, and I just thought, oh, man, I'm not sleeping very well. I just, but it was probably, you know, an offshoot of all these health problems. Maybe the high blood pressure, or maybe one of the other things I've got going on. Oh, and that's mm. not a problem either. So, like, so much has changed. And of course, now that I'm getting proper sleep, I'm more alert and I'm talking more and. You know, I probably gained a few. I probably regained a few IQ points that got knocked off there over the last few months. Ah, oh. well, that's so good to hear. You, you know, a lot of um, modern medicine gets a bad rap these days about you know they can't figure out COVID, they can't you know solve any of these broad societal problems. But it sounds like there were a lot of stuff that they could just they got solutions for. It. Right, right. They were pretty, pretty weird. It was, it was a pretty weird experience. Very unpleasant while I went through it. The other thing is that um, I was on the, like I said, I was on the cardiac floor. And I was a young pup among the patients there. I, I turned 50 in a couple <laughs> months. And everybody called me young man. Uh, I had three different roommates. That's how long I was there. <laughs> and I think at one point or another, all three of them ended up calling me young man. A wow. man. So, uh, do you want to hear a couple of funny, like, uh, roommate stories? Because these are pretty good. Please. I'd, I'd love to. The only time so, I've been in the hospital is when we were, like, having a baby or whatever. Like, I've never been an inpatient. So, uh, and those roommates are usually not very interesting. <laughs> they're, they're all fascinated with their new babies and stuff. Yeah, so the first roommate I had was the, was the only bad one, and it wasn't his fault. But he was just perfectly engineered to torment me. Um, at this point, at the, for the first few days, I had this terrible headache. Just, I mean, mind-destroying headache. Um, mm. The doctor said, this is natural. You know, your blood pressure has fallen 100 points. Your body needs to get used to it. It's going to cause a headache. I mean, it was so bad, I was, like, seeing visual distortions, like, sparkles. And, like, if you've ever sh pushed on your eyes real, real hard until you see stars, like that, yeah. but all the time. Yeah, like that, oh, all the yikes. time. And um, I was just laying there in bed with this horrible headache, and what I wanted more than anything else was I wanted to be very quiet. I wanted it to be very dark. And I wanted it to be very um, <laughs> still. So my first, um, let, let's call my first roommate Vern. Vern is, I don't know, super old. But he has an odd collection of ticks. See, he's incredibly outgoing. Loves to talk to people. Loves chit-chat. Loves small talk. Now, these are normally good things. When somebody, you know, very good at, like, welcoming people, saying nice things, always has a nice word for everybody. I can imagine what Vern was like when he was young. But now he is old, hmm. and he slurs his speech, and he's deaf. Oh, no. So, so it's COVID time, and the, you know, they cut down on the number of nurses on the floor. You know, just to that, you know, just the fewer people you have, the, the less riskier it is. So the nurses sure. don't don't have the casual pace they used to. They are moving all the time. They come in and they're like, boom, do you need anything? And they're serious about this because it's going to be 20 minutes before she can make this lap again and come back to this room. Right. So she comes into her, do you need anything? And Vern is like, oh... I just want to say that all the nurses have been so wonderful. And she stands there like, what does this guy need? What what was he saying? She's like, you, <laughs> no. you're saying you need water? And she's shouting because she knows he's deaf. You need water? <laughs> no. No. I said 
I just want to say that all your nurses, and he yells the entire, he doesn't just like, yeah, sure, water, whatever, have a nice day. He needs to get this message out, or he needs to comment on the weather. Whatever it is, it's dumb, it doesn't matter, but he has to say it. And so he repeats right, it, and right. then she's he's like, got to fulfill and then his outgoing extroverted quota for interaction because he's trying to help this nurse out by making her have a good day. Right. And, you know, she has a hundred people that are half dead that she's worrying about. And so the two of them are shouting at each other for two minutes. What? And repeating things just to have a conversation that doesn't matter and that changes nothing. And, oh, I forgot, I told this story sideways. The, the first thing Vern does is he turns on the TV. And he turns it on, and he turns it up so that he can hear it, right? And if he can hear it, everybody else can really hear it. <laughs> and, you know, if he put on sports or just the news, that would be okay. But he put on the one thing that just is engineered to make me bonkers which is ancient aliens on the history channel oh my i didn't even know that existed oh and just everything about it is like here are two languages that have this same marking different disconnected civilizations thousands of years apart and i'm like yeah there's only so many many ways you can combine two fucking straight lines you're going to end up with some plus signs when people invent writing systems. And this means aliens taught them to write. That kind of dumbass reasoning. You know, I don't uh, think the, the people who write the show are serious. They're just, you know, trying it's to like make the guys who are writing who are writing Portal, where they just say dumb things at each other until they can't stop laughing, and then they write that down. Right, right. <laughs> write that one down. Right, that nobody's gonna believe. No, it doesn't matter. So he's watching Ancient Aliens, and I'm just there. All I wanted to be is silent, and I'm just cradling my head, curled up into the fetal position, like please make it stop. And then, and then over that, they're shouting, you know, have a nice day. <laughs> Conversations at full volume, and that was rough. That was a rough couple of days. But he eventually got better and moved on. And my final roommate was named Rudy. Rudy, I, I learned just before I left, somebody asked him his birthday, and he told him it was, you know, March 3rd, 1926. And I was like, oh, wow, God. this dude, this dude. And I realized... He turned, he turned the age I am now when I turned five. <laughs> five years old. Oh. I was a little, little guy, and he was the age I am right now. Now, he had, like, really mild... Uh, my headache was over by this point. I was feeling great. I was anxious to get out of the hospital. But he had the most amazing form of dementia. Um, somebody... You know, they ask him, hey, Rudy, you you need to go for, you know, it says here you had a, a uh, let me make up something, an x-ray. You had an x-ray. When was that? They're just trying to put the timeline together and something's missing on the chart. And he goes, well, let me tell you, I, I'll tell you, I was down, I was, I was in the waiting room there with the, and the, the girl, she comes up to me in the waiting room and I'll tell you what she said. She said, what are you doing here? And I said, I'm here for an x-ray. And she goes, what? Well, you're not on my list. And, 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 I, and, I, and I told her that I, I don't know about the list. They just push me wherever I go. And like, he's, you asked him what time this, this x-ray took place. And he begins telling you this incredibly long, sprawling anecdote with multiple and the information you want is somewhere in that story. And you have to listen to the whole thing to get the information. <laughs> and it takes a while for people to catch on to this. So, eventually, oh, oh okay, you, you know, they, they finally stopped the story. They hit the, you know, 
Five thirty. Oh, you got you got it at five thirty. Okay, stop telling the story, please. Dear God, please stop telling me this story. <laughs> okay, I, I'm going to go get you, you know, your meds or whatever. I'll be right back, and then a doctor will come in and say, "Oh, Rudy, okay, you're looking good. Um, it says here you had an X-ray. When was that?" <laughs> and I'm in my bed going, "No." <laughs> You're like, hey, it was at 5.30, don't bother. <laughs> right. And I, I found out from Heather, because she cares for old people, that this is a form of dementia where you've got access to information, but you don't know how to sift it yourself. So you have to... And all of his stories were, I mean, they came across as coherent because they, they matched up every time he told them, you know, within, you know, minor details. It seemed like... He was speaking from some kind of remembered experience. They weren't just like this fever dream of nonsense. But he didn't know how to extract small bits of information from a large anecdote and deliver it. And it took people a while to, um, to learn. Okay, when he tells you something, write it down. <laughs> you don't want to have to ask him again. Oh, wow. So yeah, he didn't so, have any uh, capacity for for filtering the story down for searching in his memory. He's just like, all right, well, right. There's the whole data block. You find it. Exactly, exactly. And he was a sweet. No, again, if I had had a headache, I would have just hated him too because I would have had to hear the story thirty times. But um, and I didn't have a headache, and it was kind of funny. And he was real sweet. We'd say goodbye to each other when I left. And dang, dude, 1926. Think about all the stuff that dude has seen. Um, Man, that's like before the Model T, isn't it? Something like that. I, I don't actually know when the Model T hit the market. But yeah, the stuff he remembers. Like he... Whew, he's certainly old enough to remember for World War II. And people that can remember World War II are becoming very rare these days. That makes him, what, 94? I, I did the math and I thought he was 96, but, you know, the, the numbers are all probably off for me. Well, and who knows how accurate his memory is. That's true, too. Um, anyway, and I, so I had, I had three different colorful roommates. And the first one, I mean, I was just, I was just, seething with hatred for him what i say his name was Vern or whatever i just like hate i was like ageist ableist ultimate hate towards this guy just because he tormented me so bad like every time someone spoke to him i knew he was just gonna spend the next two minutes shouting in the room about nothing and i just wanted to go over there and smother him with a pillow it was horrible <laughs> oh, no. i was so evil I was so evil. But, you know, I was really hurting. Yeah, it's no arguing with pain. Right, right. Pain will, pain will make you evil. But, uh, yeah. But Rudy was a sweetheart, even though if he told long, ridiculous stories. <laughs> I wished I could have heard a good story. I wish somebody had asked him, say, hey, Rudy, what was it like, uh... You know, in the 1940s, after the war, what'd you do? What's that story like? Who'd you meet? What kind of job did you have? Where'd you live? You know, sure. you, you, tell us I about mean, your uncle who came back from overseas or whatever. Right. Think about the old time. <laughs> He's old enough that he could have had people from the Civil War that were veterans in his family that he met. It's crazy. Oh, yeah. Yeah. There was a lady in our, well, she's still there in the um, the writer's group back in my hometown. And she was in Germany during World War II. She was a young woman. And so she's got this whole book of memoirs about, like, all the stuff that was going on and the propaganda and, like, you know, the, all these different social programs they were doing. And, and then there's another lady in the group who's about the same age who was in Great Britain during the war. And so they had a, they had a great old time talking to each other. And... Uh, it was just incredible to hear like all this stuff that like all these details that you would never pick up from a history book because they're so 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 gritty and personal but that right. give you such a texture for like what it was really like as opposed to just what happened in broad strokes right 
I always love the stories um, from old people was like, oh yeah, I got a job that year. And you do the math and you're like, wait, weren't you 12? You, oh, well, not quite. I was 11. Yeah, I just went into the factory and I talked to the guy and his wife knew my grandma and they were friends. And so he decided to hire me for a nickel a day to jump in and out of the smasher to keep it clean. And, uh, you know, go in there and and put lard on the on the uh, crushing gears while it was running and yeah he gave me a nickel every day he said I, he was going to pay me that much only if i didn't tell the other kids because he didn't want to have to pay everybody that much <laughs> <laughs> oh man my dad has some stories like that of like you know christmas during the great depression and he got a job breaking down pallets or something so they they could buy the last Christmas tree in the lot and like haul it home on Christmas Eve and or the time he worked at the bean the bean canning factory and so he figured out how to turn the speed of the machine up but then all the ladies who were shoving the the sticks into the cans to shove the you know the beans in would like damage the cans so that it would jam up the machine but then he would try to like take the damaged cans out before they could jam up the machine and kept turning it up and up until he couldn't keep up anymore. It's like, oh man, this is so crazy. This is like the real things that happen. Right. And now, of course, it's like, oh, you know, oh, you want to get a job. Okay, we'll fill out this paperwork and we'll talk to this agency and we'll send you some stuff and we'll call you in two weeks and then they'll begin the paperwork that says that you work here. <laughs> Yeah, and then we will begin. Yeah. We will How many begin years' old... experience do you have of jumping in and out of the smasher? <laughs> Just that you could walk in and start doing a job that day. Like it's not like all right, you know, come in tomorrow for your orient. It's just like all right, you're hired. Your work's right there. Go to it. Yeah, there's still some mom and pop places that are like that, but yeah, for the most part, it's all corporatized, and you got to have all the forms filled out and stuff. Right, and it's just amazing hearing stories from people who lived in that era, and they're, yeah, it's just amazing to you, to get a feel for how different the world felt to them. It was great. Anyway, so that was my hospital stay. Thank you for indulging me. Did I really just burn half the show on that? I apologize. Hey, you've got a lot to say now. You've been getting some sleep. It's true. It's true. All right, so what did you do while I was gone? Please tell me you played a video game. Uh, yeah, I, I'm still playing Valheim. I basically reached the end game where you've got uh, access to all the stuff that you need. And uh, yeah, I, I'm just kind of fooling around at this point. I need to, to defeat some more fooling. They're like goblin villages or whatever so that I can get some totems so that I can summon the final boss so that I can die a whole bunch trying to beat him. So that's uh, that's where I'm at in Valheim. It, it's mostly just kind of playing around and you know gathering things and keeping up with the farm and maybe upgrading some buildings and stuff. It's a good time though. Excellent. I did play a tiny bit of video game this week. Um, I played uh, well today. I played the Mass Effect Legendary Edition, and oh boy. Is it ever a console port? Oh, yeah. Oh, everything just feels a little awkward with it. Just, the interface feels wrong. Um, yeah, it's, it's just... It's just weird. It's just weird. Now, some hardcore PC fans are really upset. People are complaining. I'm using uh, the controller. Oh, that makes it uh, easier. It, right, yeah, right. The keyboard and mouse but, is always really difficult on a console port. Right. And some people are really complaining about that. Like, um, it apparently has negative mouse acceleration that can't be turned off or adjusted. Oh, no. Like, that's the... So, if you're trying to play mouse and keyboard, it's apparently real, real bad. I've been playing on the um, controller... Uh, my only complaint was just, dang, it's sluggish when you're alt-tabbing. Um, like, forever. And even the the launcher, there's a launcher for all three games, Mass Effect 1, 2, and 3, and it runs full screen. And I don't like that. Like, launchers should be a tiny window, if they need to exist at all. Um, I have a bunch of little... Yeah. 
little gripes like so, that about it. And you can't alt-tab out, out of the launcher either? Right, it doesn't like to go, or it acts like, you know, you'll see the alt-tab window appear, and it'll act like you shift it, and the music will stop, and everything will hang for five seconds, and then poof, you snap back into the launcher. I'm like, ugh, come on, I just want to adjust one thing before I, you know, begin playing the game. So, I don't know what that is, uh, what what the deal is there. But yeah, the, they do not like to be alt-tabbed. It just takes forever. You know, some games are um, just instant. You can just alt-tab and they don't mind. They keep running in the background. And other games just, they act like you've changed the resolution and they want to dump all their memory and reallocate all textures every time you alt-tab in and out. And, uh... Yeah... I think yeah, it has something this... to do with windowed borderless versus true full screen. Because I yeah. know when you go to windowed borderless, it's a lot easier to alt tab out, and then like full screen actually has to change like the the monitor mode or something. Right, and I did get it into borderless mode, and that helped, but it was still, it was still like, ugh, this does not feel like, you know, a remaster of a classic game. Where you expect things to be, you know, snappy and tight and fast. And, and and I was fighting with it for reasons that weren't even Mass Effect's fault. I couldn't record any footage from it, and I was like, I've dealt with this before. What What is it? What I, Games have done this to me before, and I'm racking my brain trying to remember. And then, you know, alt-tabbing in and out and messing with my recording software, trying to get it to, like just take screenshots and record footage of the game for like yeah. half an hour. And finally I remembered, oh, it's Origin, it's EA's shitty launcher. Um, just blocks uh, everything. EA. Yeah, like in a way that Steam doesn't. If you record a Steam game, it just records the game normally. And, you know, your hotkeys work and everything. And it's fine. And if you like get a Steam achievement, that just shows up in the recording. Origin is weird in that it's just like this. It's just like a big linebacker. It gets in the way. It won't let anything through, protecting the thing. So it eats all hotkeys and blocks all capturing. And, it, you know, I play like an Origin game every other year. So I always forget. Oh, right, I have to turn off Origin, and you have to do it on a per-game basis. Wow. So, um, yeah, you can't just say, no, piss off with your terrible overlay. I don't care about EA achievements. No, you've got to turn it off on a per So once I turned that off, everything got a lot better. But it was still like, I spent like 40 minutes starting the game over and over and fussing with things trying to solve this problem. And I was like, wow, this doesn't feel like a port of an old game. It looks like a port of an old game. You know, it looks like an old game. Everything's a little bit low poly. <laughs> but, you know, it runs like like a brand new game that my computer isn't up for. <laughs> That's really weird. So, what does remaster mean if it doesn't mean, like, making the graphics better? is What, what were they doing? Oh, they did. They did. The, the graphics are way, way more detailed. They've been definitely given higher resolution, but the polygons are, they didn't remodel everything, right? Okay. So, yeah. So it's a bump up in texture density by many, many times. This isn't just like double. This is quite a bit. I remember the game looking a little muddy even in 2007, and now it looks super crisp, even by 2021 standards. That's cool. Oh, uh, yeah. Yeah. Um, now, is this the thing that you were writing your, your Mass Effect retrospective book in anticipation of its launch, or was that something else? Yes. Yes. I wanted the book to be out when this game dropped. And that was what I was supposed to do last week, is get the book rolling, do a video to promote it. I had all these great plans, and of course none of that happened. And I got home just in time for the game to come out. My book actually, we got a proof of my book, and it arrived while I was in the hospital. It is big. My, my wife um, 
brought it into the hospital and showed it to me, and it is an enormous door stopper of a book. <laughs> oh, it's so fun. Um, it is. It is fun. It's a good-looking book. Um, now I've got to scramble to get it out and make sure it stays right. You know, I don't want it to come out just as the conversation around uh, Mass Effect dies down. I want to strike what the whole point of this was to strike when the iron is hot. And uh, so that's what I get to scramble to do this week. But yeah, the book is real. Looks good. I was happy with it. I don't know if... Uh, I don't know if it's going to sell well, but I'm proud of it. Well, that's excellent to hear. I I know you've been working on that for uh, over a month now, right? Or maybe two months? Right. Yeah, about a month, I think. I can't believe I wound up in the hospital just as it came out. Just as it, just as it was time to launch. I was, I was going to have a uh, This Dumb Industry video to go with its launch. And then at the end of the video, point everybody towards the book. But no, that's not what happened. Well, you could still do it, I suppose, but yeah. Right, it's right. Like, I mean, that's delayed a bit. Right. That's that's my next job. It starts tomorrow. You know, make some kind of video. Just uh, don't try to add any content about the, the new port that they just released. <laughs> oh, right. <laughs> just keep adding on to the book and making it bigger and bigger forever. Maybe you could uh, release a compendium in a couple of months. Right. All right, uh, got some mailbags piled up. Maybe we should cover those. Yeah, this first one I, I was really looking forward to. All right, go for it. Dear Seamus, to what extent are you interested in audio programming? I guess composing any track with the DAW in an array of soft synths can be considered programming, but I'm thinking of approaches that are less linear and more system-based in ways that we usually think when using the term. Um, and then there's general music. This is a very long question. Uh, he's got some examples of some stuff. And uh, yeah, M music and computer generated music and audio generated by the computer regards the letter D. Thank you, D. Thank you, the letter D. I just want to thank you in return, uh, D. Back in the day, you sponsored some really great episodes of Sesame Street. And just from the bottom of my heart, I want to tell you, I really appreciated um, the support you gave to those episodes. Those were great. Thank you so much. Um, yeah, so I, I, the line between programming and what we'll call fucking around with electronic music is super blurry. So I've done stuff like this I made a a bunch of triggers that would set each other off and and do different things so that you just push one key on a keyboard and it would you know the quote-unquote song within the DAW would turn that into a chord and then play that along with and you know make up a bunch of notes that go with that chord and throw down a beat in 4-4 time. So you just hold one key and it begins playing a song with that as its as the root of a chord, as a suggestion for a chord root. And then, you know, whenever you like, you press another key and it'll switch to another chord. And that's pretty fun. Mm. That was... So you just... It feels like you're playing a song by just pressing one button, right? And that's very silly. What I've wanted to do over the years, <laughs> what I've wanted more than anything else to do over the years is make my own soft synth. That's something I'm really into, but I've never found like the right, like wh where do you start? Like where's the on-ramp for this? A lot of people have done it, um, but like what, what's, what tools do you need? How do you get started? How do you make one? And a soft synth is like, okay, when we say DAW, we're talking about a, a digital audio workstation, the program that somebody uses to make music. When you edit images, you're using Photoshop. When you're writing, you're using a word processor. And when you're making music, you're using a DAW, right? This is the, the software you use to manipulate the sounds to make the music. 
But right. with and, and but, you and I both use Audacity for as a, a digital audio workstation software. But I think this is more like generating the music as opposed to just editing the music, right? Right. Well, but I also, I mean, I don't just use Audacity. I'm not that much of a of a badass that I can make music with just Audacity. I use Ableton um, to like, <laughs> you know, sequence all the notes and everything. And mm. um, and a a DAW like that can take plugins, so you can give it a plugin that's like, oh, here's how you you know this plugin is really good at at pretending to be an electric guitar. So you send it notes, and it will make sounds like an electric guitar. And there are all kinds of them. And you basically you know every soft synth is kind of an instrument and some of them are very humorous and some of them are novelty and some of them are incredibly specialized and some of them are incredibly generalized you know oh here this one is designed to mimic you know about a hundred or so different early synthesizers from the early 80s and um, I've been fascinated by soft synths like that and I've always wanted to write my own but I've you know never found the never found the time or the information to get started hmm I, i've got a electric piano that has a it's got a i think it's got a bad d to a converter or or some something's gone wrong in the in the synthesizer where the piano doesn't work anymore but the midi out still works so i bought a little synth box where you can plug the MIDI in and then it'll synthesize, you know, it's got a bunch of different instruments and stuff, but this thing is covered in knobs. So you can adjust like the attack and the delay and the oh, reverb yeah. and the, the wah wah and all that stuff is, you know, like probably 80 knobs on the thing. And I it's really it. fun to play with because they got all these, these presets where you can be like, well, you know, here's the cosmic instrument or whatever. And so it's got the very kind of thing, but then you can, <laughs> adjust all the knobs and like change all the presets. So it's still got the same bass sound thing, but you're adjusting all of the, the attributes of it. And, and you can get some really fun effects and then you can change it while you're playing some things. So you can like play a chord and like tweak one of the knobs and it adjusts it. It's, it's very fun. It's, it's very intimidating too. Cause it's like, well, there's all these options and like what would give you the sound that you want? And like, do you even know what you want? And I don't know. It, it's, I've, I've wanted to, like you were saying, make something that synthesizes stuff directly from code. So you didn't have any inputs. It was all synthesized, like all generated and then have right. it generate the music itself so that you could just like press a button and it'll just play you some music like built from scratch or whatever. But uh, like, like you said, where do you start with that? It's, it's a very, uh, it's a very ground up kind of thing. It's like building your own 3d modeling software almost. Cause it's like, well, how do you generate the waveform and how do you get the data to the audio card and what what are the synchronization right. protocols there and and like and once you have that all down then like what do you do to make something sound like anything <laughs> like there's all this audio right. theory in there like do you want a violin sound or like do you just care if it's a square wave or yeah i was trying to make a tuba but it was sounds like a theremin but pff, close enough <laughs> Yeah, well, theremin's pretty easy, and really, at that point, but right, right. Now, if you try yeah. to make a theremin and you accidentally make a tuba, that's that's the badass way around. <laughs> <laughs> you just keep trying until you got a whole orchestra. I tried to make a pure soft synth, you know, just make pure tones, and it accidentally replicated a human opera singer. <laughs> <laughs> Started singing all these words in Latin. I started to look them up on Google Translate, but then I decided not to. <laughs> It works. I'll just put some comments in the code telling people not to mess with it and don't worry about it. <laughs> so, yes, to answer the question, yes, I've wanted to, but just, oh, there's so many things I want to do. This, this is something that, um, that came to my mind when I was in the hospital, is realizing the overwhelming number of things I still want to do. <laughs> like... There are so many cool projects to work on. It's not so much about like, no, I'm too young to die. It's like, but I didn't get to do this cool thing yet. There's so yeah. much stuff oh. to make. Man. 
didn't you make a little bit of a, a generative music thing with um with the the sudoku program where it would like stitch pieces of music together yeah i did it just had some tracks that it would you know multiply it was basically djing some pre-made music for you hmm but it seems like it wouldn't be too difficult to like walk that back a step and have it like stitch those samples together out of smaller of like individual notes or whatever and then like walk that right. back and take like the individual notes and generate those individually and at that point you've got a soft sense right right you've got a soft soft synth that yeah you want to do that whole thing from oh here's you know something in the key of e minor and we're going to play the third and we're going to have a 4 4 beat under it and then you want to jump from like that conceptual space like that very basic here's some notes you're playing pick an instrument and go and then at the other extreme you've got like um the DJ end of it where the music's coming out and you're just adjusting volume levels and filters and you know to to create interest or to make the music you know kind of change a little bit so the loop doesn't get old yeah and yeah and and you could with the the thing that kind of boggles my mind is like as soon as you have something that can generate it on the level on 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 the whole spectrum from individual notes to shape of music over the period of an hour let's say then you really could have it adjust all of those slowly over time and the music could morph from one thing into another like as you're as you're listening to it and, and you right. could just have it play as long as you want it never repeat itself right like it, it could just be a music generation thing and and that would be as much work as just getting the system working right like once it's working it's the procedural generation dream of like once i get the system right. working, i'll have all the content i could ever want right it's i've got to make it's the my yeah like you said the minecraft problem like making a generalized proc gen generator is incredibly difficult but once you do it it takes the problem of making content and just trivializes it and you can make as much as you want forever they nearly did that in the original Sims. They had um, a jazz musician just play around the circle of fifths, just all the way around, and improvise very... very there's a video on this. I'll see if I can find it. Um, it's by a YouTuber I really like, who's a jazz pianist. Um, and just put it this way, a, a real musician put this track together for the original Sims, but when you hear what it was doing, you realize, oh, that could easily have been programmed. That could e that didn't need a creative human being to do it. That could have been something that somebody sequenced according to a few rules. Yeah, that sounds really cool. It it, it seems like it seems like it would be easy to do, right? But then no one does it, so maybe it's right, not that which easy. Makes it, exactly, that's what I've always thought. It seems like it would be super easy, but I know I'm not the smartest person who ever lived, so I'll bet it's harder than it than it th seems conceptually. And uh, listening to some of these samples that he... I listened to the, um, the examples at the end of this question, and they're not pleasant to listen to. Like, it's, a, it's an interesting result, but it's not... It's not something I would just kick back and be like, let's put on some of this computer-generated tunes. <laughs> right. And that's obviously, the, I mean, the real goal for me would be, like you said, just a an improvised computer, an improvised soundtrack for a game. Just background music. Like, you'd want um, bespoke music for, like, the main, you would want a piece of music that everybody has heard to, to represent the game itself. But during the game, mm -hmm. you would want it to be just improvising as much as possible because, you you know, no matter how good the music is, sooner or later the player gets tired of hearing that loop. And yeah, fixing that means just making so many hours of music that it's just, you know, impractical. Well, and not only that, but you could do things with the music that people haven't really been able to do before. They did a little bit of this in Prison Architect, 
where they had several different layers of music going on. And then as you were focusing on different areas in your prison or as different events were happening in your prison or different times of the day, they would ramp up and down the volume levels of those different tracks so that you could have a different, it gave it a different feel. Um, but you could do something like that only with the actual structure of the music instead of just the volume. Instead of like you were saying, instead of doing it DJ style, you could actually do it with a composition in real time where if you're walking up a hill and you're about to round the corner and see a group of bandits, you could have the music get all tense. It's like, oh, what's going to happen here? You could do stuff right. like that with like, like movie music where you're building a mood in real time in response to the player's actions as opposed to just like having a music track for the biome that you're in for example which most games do nowadays right music that understands tension so you know when you want to create tension you you know you will choose a certain chord within within a given key one that has a lot of tension in it, maybe you'll do a lot of repetition to where it feels like the, the, the song is about to break through to something new. So it feels kind of repetitive and you kind of get antsy waiting for, for it to... The, the classic example being waiting for the drop. But, like, that's yeah, a really yeah. blunt... The, that, the tone just keeps rising and rising and rising and the, the uh, bass line gets really repetitive and really quick and... And you're like awaiting oh, for, okay, this is building to something. Was it building to? It's building to the drop, of course. But like, that's the feeling that you get every time. And it's incredible. Right. But, you know, there, there's more subtler versions of that where it's just a little bit repetitive. Maybe, maybe a chord that's not super stable. It can create this anticipation for the music to maybe calm down again or to do something different or to go through a key change. You can feel it coming, even if you're not a musician, just because of your lifetime of being exposed to music. You know yeah. that something's about to happen. So if the game knows something like that's about to happen, it can... Now, that's kind of a funny thing, like, oh, the game knows, oh, I'm in the hallway leading to the bad guy. I better build up some tension. And then what happens if the player just stands there for 10 minutes? <laughs> like, right? right. The, the pitch just keeps rising and rising. Soon it's supersonic. Right. Like, how do, how do you... Uh... Like, the character if just the... drops dead from the suspense. <laughs> right. So that's kind of the, the but that kind of stuff is fun to think about. Oh, how can you do that without it seeming too canned or too mechanical? Well, you could make it part of the mechanics, right? Like you could like in in braid where time goes forward and you move forward and time goes backward and you move backward as you're moving down the hallway yeah. it's building up and you stop and it just like stays there at that level and you like take take a step forward and it goes up a note and you take a step back and goes down a note. <laughs> it could be kind of fun. <laughs> right? I, I would love to do stuff like that, to play around with that, where where the game itself changes music based on your behavior. And there's just, that's almost too big a topic, like, you could make a whole game about that and not scratch the surface. There is so much to be done there. But, like, Yeah, there's been very... so much done with visual and environmental procedural generation. But, and, and maybe there has been some stuff done with music procedural generation, I just don't know about it, but it seems like... In right. gaming, at least, that doesn't seem to be a very common avenue that, that's been explored. And I'd love to do it, but I feel like whoever does it needs to know more about music than I do. <laughs> like, okay, I could do interesting things with this, but somebody who really is a musician, plays multiple instruments, and has a deep understanding of music could do so much more. But, like... Once you get into that space, those people less and are less and less likely to be programmers. Like there's this kind of spectrum of like super artistic on one side and super um, concrete on the other. And we're almost trying to take the, you need the best parts of the two extreme ends of this spectrum and to bring them together. Well, if you ever get on a kick of audio programming, uh, reach out because I do play multiple instruments. At the same time, are you a one-man band, Paul? I've always <laughs> loved those. <laughs> what Mary Poppins? The... <laughs> I was just about to reference Bert from Mary Poppins. You walk around like that all the time. Yeah. Well, you know, how do you think I got so many kids? 
That's how that works, right? Sure. I, I believe you. I have no reason to doubt. Let's uh let's do one more mailbag. I forget whose turn it is. Hi. Not a question, but I found a, I stumbled upon a clip of Todd Howard saying the phrase What do they eat? I found it amusing. So have a chuckle too. Best regards, Deadly Dark. So you're using stumble upon? Whoa, man. Way to use the internet in 2005. I would have used Ask Jeeves. <laughs> right. Well, I would have put it on Dig. It may have been before my um, time. Oh, you don't remember Dig? Oh, well. So, I'll put it on Fark.com. There you go. There's a classic. Fark. Anyway, so this, this clip of Todd Howard is very interesting. It's not just him saying, but what do they eat? It's like... Of course, it's been a week. I, I meant to cover this last week, but it's like um, him talking about a fictional society. What do they eat? What's their government like? You know, how do they make their clothes? Where do, what, you know, what's their religion like? And he lists all these questions, which are things that I'm always on about. Like, oh, here you've made up a fictional village. What's their religion? How do they relate to other villages around them? How do they get food? How do they get water? How do they defend themselves? How do they relate to others? How do they educate their people? You know, how do they choose a leader? These are all the things that, you know, when you're writing, you don't have to put it in the story, but you have to, like, think about it. Because if you don't mm -hmm. have if you don't have anything in mind, then there won't be anything, and it'll just feel like a collection of people with exclamation marks over their heads. Or even worse, you'll project your own culture onto them, and then it'll be like right. a weird mishmash of... Americana in some weird setting. Right. You get the Dennis the Peasant, you know, uh, some some feudal age peasant with a head full of ideas about modern democracy and personal liberty that would be completely inappropriate for the time because you don't know what you're doing and you don't know how government works. <laughs> And they don't seem appropriately alien. You have not transported the audience anywhere. Um, they just feel mm. like, oh, this is a very unimaginative setting. And it's amazing to hear Todd Howard say these things. Because right. it feels like his games are like, like, when you list games that suffer from, nobody thought about this. It, Bethesda games are at the top of the list. What do these people eat? Why do they live here? Where do they get water? How does government work? What are their relationships? So, like, no, like, Bethesda games are often built with no consideration for these sorts of things. And yet he talks about it the way I would talk about it. And you wonder, like, where did it all go wrong, Todd? Like, something's yeah. broken between you and your product. <laughs> Yeah, if if he had no interest in world building, then that would be one thing and be like, fine, you know, to each their own. But the fact that he's conversant in the language and the critical features of world building makes you wonder like, okay, so you don't have the excuse that you don't know what you're doing. What's your excuse now? <laughs> right. Why aren't you? Do Those are all good questions. Why do you never answer them, Todd? And... You know, is this a case where he's in management and he doesn't have the power to, like, make this happen? On a, You know, like, his people just have no head for it, and he's just like, all right, well, this is what they wrote for me. Yeah. Well, I mean, it's it's a truism, but doing complicated things is hard, so, yeah. <laughs> at, at least he's trying, saying? I guess. Right. Right. At least it's just fascinating. I just want to know, like Todd, why why doesn't any of this make it into the game? None of it. None of these questions are ever answered, and you know that they're real questions, and you know that they're interesting. How does this happen? It's so weird. Yeah, I mean, I would expect Todd Howard. To, okay, there was the the infamous guy from Bioware. 10 years ago talking about the awesome button and he's just shouting about yeah. oh you push the button something awesome happens awesome button 
And like that's the mindset I would assume went into making like Fallout 4. Like, oh boy, let's make awesome things happen. What are the? I need to answer questions. Nothing. No. Just no matter what they push, their character needs to say something cool or funny. It doesn't need to make sense or fit in the world or fit the character. It just needs to be cool. It just needs to be awesome. And then they need to blow something up. Can we have them wearing power armor and fighting a death claw in the first five minutes of the game? Great. Do that. Drop nukes on things. Blow things up. Make things crazy. And, um,. That's what it feels like. But then you hear Todd Howard talk. Todd Howard is such an odd individual. Like when I hear him talk, I think, all right, this guy really knows what he's doing. And then when I play his games, I'm like, this was made by an idiot. <laughs> Maybe he's just really good at, at sales and marketing. I mean, he is. I mean, that's, these games sell really well. So he is good at those things. I'm just... I'm just baffled at the, at the, how does the machinery of Bethesda work? Well, what I'm saying is that maybe he doesn't actually care about what do they eat. He just knows that that's the kind of things that gamers like to hear in interviews about a game that's coming out. Oh, yeah. Yeah, he said lots of things. He talks about emergent, you know, gameplay, and he talks about all this crazy stuff that, you know, sounds he almost sounds like an indie dev, like a John Blow going up there talking about the theory of, you know, how we pl engage with games and how we form ideas and how we interact with systems and the expectation of the audience. And you think, holy cow, this guy's really, you know, tapped into the low level of the, the gaming scene. And he's down there in the trenches working on the theory of how games should work. You know, it feels like... He feels like an early Spielberg when he talks, just sort of like, oh, why can't we do this? Let's just do this. But then you look at his products, and it's, and it's just so the opposite of everything his, his talks indicate. It's so weird. I get that a lot of people hate him, but I just find him endlessly fascinating because of this almost duality in his personality, like the... The dissonance between what he says and what his products are like are fascinating. Hmm. I I don't want to cast aspersions, but it sounds like he's a real scumbag. <laughs> Somewhere out there is an alternate universe where there's a Todd Howard who comes out and like, yes, this you were coming out with another shooter and you're gonna shoot guys from behind cover. This year we've added grenades, you know, and it's just like this, this recitation of expected features, but then the game comes out and it feels like it was made by Hideo Kojima. And it's just this madhouse of weird mechanics that you've never seen before <laughs> that he pretends are just, you know, more of the same. Oh man. And he's got a, he's got a little beard. He's got a little evil beard. He's got a little evil Spock beard. <laughs> alternate universe right you still haven't played frog fractions have you i've totally forgot about frog fractions all right well there's something to do for next week frog fractions you can just look up a playthrough if you don't want to play yourself it's you know it's fine all right then well paul i feel like we've done a show yeah here we are we're back at it I apologize to everybody for inflicting my long um, anecdotes on you about being in the hospital. I hope you found them fun. Thanks to everybody who sent in questions. If you have a question for the show, the email is diecast at Um, Yeah, we didn't even get through all the questions. In fact, we did not even get through half of them. Sorry to all the questions that have gotten bumped yet another week. They're still in the queue. We'll get to them eventually. Thanks, everybody, for the questions. Say goodbye, Paul. Goodbye. Also goodbye.
So I looked it up and the letter D did sponsor episode 16 of Sesame Street. Just episode 16? That was the first one. I, I don't know. I didn't find an extensive, exhaustive list. We need, but... we need to get the full, you know, filmography of D. Especially since he was so nice as to write us a letter. Right. You know, there have been thousands and thousands of episodes of Sesame Street. So I'm, I kind of have this hunch that maybe some letters have done more than one episode. They must have. Yeah, it must have. 